Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos addressing concepts and theories in international relations. This video focuses in particular on the theoretical approach of neorealism, which arose in the late 1970s to become, alongside of neoliberalism, one of the most influential approaches to understanding global politics. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, if Hans Morgenthau's Politics of Among Nations was the seminal text of classical realism, then Kenneth Waltz's 1979 book, The Theory of International Politics, can be thought of as the foundational text of neorealism. I'm not going to spend much time in this video on classical realism. If you're not yet familiar with it, go back, uh, check out the other video we have on classical realism where we look at it, the, that theory in greater detail. Instead, in this video, we're going to focus on neorealism instead. Now, while Waltz's neorealism represented an important break from classical realism in a number of ways, it also shared some foundational assumptions about the nature of the international system. Indeed, classical realism and neorealism share a host of common beliefs. Both classical and neorealism assert that they are empirical rather than normative theories, analyzing the world as it is rather than how it ought to be. Though we'll discuss in a video on critical theories of international relations, many critical theories would dispute that assertion. Second, both consider the state to be the principal actor of global politics. And both believe that states are rational, unitary actors who operate in the pursuit of the national interest. And finally, both classical and neorealists maintain that the distribution of power or of capabilities between states largely determines international outcomes. That said, neorealism breaks from classical realism in several important ways. The most important break centers on the determinant of state behaviors. For classical realists, conflict between states, the struggle for power, is rooted in human nature. Human beings are self-interested and power-seeking, and states as human communities reflect that nature. Neorealists, by contrast, dismiss the explanatory power of human nature and instead root their explanation of state behavior in the anarchic nature of the international system. The lack of a world government means for neorealists that states must protect themselves, and consequently they view other states as threat to their survival and interest. Indeed, because of their focus on the structure of the international system, neorealists are sometimes called structural realists. Classical realism tends to place a greater emphasis on understanding the unique historical circumstances of a given situation. While human nature may tend to favor certain behaviors, understanding the historical context is important to classical realists. They also tend to be more philosophical in their outlook, drawing on classic texts and political theory. Neorealism, by contrast, tends to be much more ahistorical. Waltz and subsequent neorealists were interested in developing a more scientific understanding of global politics. By focusing on the structural elements of global politics, neorealists tend to treat actors as interchangeable and tend to focus more on questions like the polarity of the international system instead of on the nature of individual states. And finally, classical realism tends to focus on the question of power, which neorealists argue is too narrowly defined as military power. Instead of power, neorealists argue that the question of national security, which they contend is a broader definition and includes the idea of state capacity, not just military prowess, is more important. Now, as a quick aside, it's important to note that classical realists reject this claim and contend that their definition of power includes a broader conception of influence rather than just military force. So briefly then, what's the argument advanced by neorealism? Simply that the international system is anarchic. There is no organizing authority above the state to monitor or enforce behavior among the states. As a result, every state must operate in their own interest, pursuing their own national security. Now, the distribution of power within the international system, that is, the idea of balance of power, uh, is explored in another video. And for neorealists, balance of power can make conflict more or less likely, but it doesn't change the overall goal of the state. As a result, states must work to ensure their own survival, their own national security. The self-help nature of the international system means that states cannot generally trust or rely on one another, and that relative rather than absolute gains dominate. As a result, states must take steps to ensure their own security. 
Now, as we consider in another video, when we examine the constructivist approach to international relations, by behaving in a self-help manner, states may indeed create the very anarchy in the international system their moves are intended to protect themselves against. But that's a topic for another video. So that concludes our very brief introduction to neorealism. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series and leave any questions you have below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye.